Praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for all that we have learned and all that we have heard since the beginning of the worship. And we thank the Lord for the blessings we have received from the time of prayer, the time of searching the scriptures together, and the time of uh, the various uh, choirs ministering to us. I pray that everything will have uh, an indelible mark in everyone uh, in Jesus' name. Now we come to the word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for your people. We thank you for the spirit of worship. And we thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your protection. And thank you for telling us the things we go through that your presence will always be with us and your purpose will be fulfilled in our lives and your power will not be missing in any of our lives in Jesus' name. We ask, Lord, as we come to this important passage of Scripture, you enlighten us, you strengthen us, you empower us, you endure us with more of your spirit and your power and to have the right attitude and to know that we are to focus on Christ all the time, every moment, all the days of our lives. Grant your people victory and give us the spirit of the conqueror in every situation, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. We thank the Lord for bringing us to the service today. I wish I could see you directly, but you know the condition in which we are now, which we believe will soon end, and I will see you very soon. Today we're coming to 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 12. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. In verse 13, it says, But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, we're waiting for that time, when his glory shall be revealed, he shall be glad also with exceeding joy. In verse 14 it says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. Verse 15 says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Look at verse 16, very significant. It says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. I want you to underline that word, Christian. If any man suffer as a Christian, if any man lives as a Christian, if any man behaves as a Christian, if any man comports himself, conducts himself as a Christian, what does that mean as a born-again Christian? What does that mean as a ransomed redeemed, righteous Christian. What does that mean? It means a person who has turned away from sin. And that person has turned away from sin. He has turned to the Savior. And because he has repented and he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, then the salvation of the Lord comes to him. And it's a real experience that the Spirit of God will bear witness in his heart. This is a child of God. That word, Christian, look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 26, Christian. The word, Christian, we need to understand the origin of that word, the meaning of that word, and we also need to know the implication of that word. If you say you are a Christian, look at this in Acts chapter 11, reading from verse 26, it says, And when he had found him... He brought him unto Antioch. He's talking about Barnabas bringing Saul, Paul the apostle, to Antioch. And it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church. 
they assemble themselves or the church, those ministers assemble with the members of the church and taught and taught much people. Look at this. And the Christians, not just churchgoers, and the disciples, they were called Christians first in Antioch because of their faith, the dynamism of their faith. Because of their faith, the obvious, visible uh, result of their faith, because of their faith, their character coming out of their faith, their conduct coming out of their faith, their lifestyle coming out of their faith, those disciples, those followers of Christ, they were called Christians first in Antioch. What can I say about a Christian? What does the Bible say about a Christian? Now we need to understand this because it is the very foundation of what we're looking at today that if you suffer as a Christian, if you suffer as a Christian, you need to understand then whether you're a Christian or not. And whether you're suffering, your persecution, your affliction is the suffering of a Christian, the persecution of a Christian, the affliction of a Christian. Who are Christians? Christians are Christ-like believers. They come to Christ, a change happens in their lives, and then they become real followers of Christ. And the Bible describes them with these seven words I'm going to give you now. Number one, they are converted. Number two, they are cleansed. Number three, they are righteous. Number four, they are godly. Number five, they are just, they are obedient. And number seven, they are harmless. Look at them one by one. They are converted. If somebody is not converted, it's not a Christian. If somebody is not born again, it's not a Christian. If somebody does not have a change of life, a change of heart, a transformation of life that comes out of conversion to Christ and conversion by Christ. If somebody does not have that, is not a Christian yet. Number one, a Christian is a converted person. Look at Acts chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 19. Acts chapter 3, looking at verse 19, it tells us, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. Repentance comes before conversion. A moment comes in your life. A moment comes in a person's life that is convicted of sin. And he realizes that the way of sin is going to lead to perdition and to eternal judgment. Because of that, he says, I must turn. I must repent. I must come to the Lord. I must allow the grace of God to work in my life. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. That's what happens at conversion. That all the sins you have committed, sins you were born. The big ones and the little ones, the hidden ones and the upward ones, they are blotted out. And it says, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. It's the work of God. Conversion. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Conversion. When conversion has taken place, we say it's a Christian. It's a Bible-believing Christian. It's a Christ-centered, Christ-controlled Christian. Number two, he is cleansed. In fact, he tells us in Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, reading from verse 25, it says in verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. It's not talking of a bishop sprinkling water on you of a pastor sprinkling water on you, is talking about God himself. Conversion is the work of God. Becoming a Christian is the work of God. Then when I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. When God sprinkles that water of life on you, that cleansing water on you, it says, and ye shall be clean from all Mark that all, from all, underline that all. It says, from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. The salvation is not, you know, little by little. I turn a little today, I repent a little today. And then over a long period of time, God 
is converting me no conversion is what happens at a moment of time. In verse 26, it says, a new heart will I also give you. It's the gift of God. It is what God gives himself. And it says, a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Verse 25 is talking about salvation. And verse 26 is talking about sanctification. Verse 27 is talking about immersion in the Holy Ghost. It's talking about the baptism in the Spirit. It says, and I will put my spirit, that's the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Number one, a Christian is a converted believer. A Christian is a cleansed believer. Number three now, a Christian is a righteous believer. Righteous, righteous. It's not just a church goer, not just I'm following them. It's not that I was born in a Christian family, whatever that means, Christian family, that's where I was born. That doesn't make somebody a Bible Christian. What makes a person a Christian? If you are suffering, you need to know why you are suffering. And you need to know that yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on this behalf. See, the Christian is righteous. In Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 6, we're looking at verse 18. It says, being then made free from sin. God does that. He makes us free from sin. At the point of conversion, at the time you come to Christ, at the time the grace of God comes to your life, being then made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. He became the servants of righteousness. In verse 22, it says, but now be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And then he tells us about the Christian that the Christian is godly. It's not godless. The Christian is godly. He tells us in Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. It says in chapter 2 of uh, Titus, verse 11, for the grace of of God that bringeth salvation. That's what grace does in our lives. We're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. When that grace of God comes to us, it brings salvation. The same thing, salvation, conversion, the, the same thing, we're adopted into the family of God for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Look at the consequence in verse 12. In verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, in this present evil world, in this present sinful world, we live godly. Why? Because the grace of God has come into our lives. The Christian is a Christ-like believer. And number one is converted. Number two is cleansed. Number three is righteous. Number four is godly. Number five, he is just. In Hebrews uh, chapter 10, reading from verse 38, Hebrews chapter 10, looking at verse 38, is talking about the real Christian now. But the just shall live by faith. Is converted by faith, is transformed by grace, and his life now is a life of faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now that he's living by faith, is the just. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. In verse 39, it says, But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now the Christian is also an obedient believer, obedient child of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, 1 Peter 
chapter 1, reading from verse 14, it's uh, telling us of the grace of God that comes into our lives and the goodness of God in our lives that makes us children of God. And then it brings equality into our lives, equality that comes from heaven, and it drops in our heart. It says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, it says a change has taken place now. Since Christ came into the heart, a change has taken place. The former behavior, the former lusts were the laws for disobedience and the laws for selfishness and the laws for pleasing ourselves. But now we're born again. Now we're Christians. And it says as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance. Then in verse 15 it says, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Verse 16 says, it says, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. The Christian then is somebody who has been converted. Are you converted? The Christian is somebody who has been cleansed by the Lord himself. Are you cleansed? Are you clean? The Christian is a person who by the grace of God has become righteous and is following after the righteousness of faith. Are you righteous by faith? And the Christian is the one that is godly. As the grace of God come to you, did the Spirit of God bear witness with your heart? What day was that? What time was that? And in what condition was that? How did you repent? And can you say, this is how I was converted. I became a Christian. And now the godliness is there. And you are just and you are obedient. Is your life different now from the former time? And are you carrying the badge of holiness around in your heart, in your mind, in your language, in everything that you do? In short, are you a Christian, a Bible Christian, a righteous Christian, a rapturable Christian? Be ye holy, for I am holy. Not only that, a Christian is harmless. A Christian is harmless. He will not hurt it will not harm a neighbor, a friend, an enemy, a classmate, and a neighbor, anyone living in the same place or anyone he comes across. This one we call a Christian in his life, the product of his life, the result of his life is harmlessness. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15, that she may be blameless and harmless, underline those words, that's talking about you. If you're a child of God, that's talking about you. If you have got the grace of God and you're living by that grace, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And then he says in verse 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. That's the Christian. We need to define the Christian, describe the Christian. We need to declare what the Christian is before we look at his suffering. Today, the message is abundant grace from God for persecuted Christians. Now that we know who the Christian is and we understand how the grace of God will be abundant in our lives, coming from God in the midst of the persecution of the Christian. We're looking at the message under three subtitles today. Number one, the predicted persecution of godly Christians. The uh, predicted persecution of godly Christians. Number two, the purified partakers with the glorified Christ. The purified partakers with the glorified Christ. And then number three, the promised preservation by our glorious creator. The promised preservation by our glorious creator. Point number one now, the predicted persecution 
of a godly a Christians. We're going to look at three things here. And number one, we're going to look at the present persecution of godly Christians. And then number two, we're going to look at the pronounced punishment of guilty creatures. Number three, we're going to look at the pleasant personality of God glorifying God honoring Christians. Number one is the present persecution of godly Christians. It says in First Peter chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 12 it says beloved, it's talking about the Christian child of God beloved, beloved to God beloved to Christ, beloved to heaven and beloved to the angels of God and beloved to the body of Christ, beloved think it not strange concerning the very trial which is to try you is to try you to see whether you are for real, whether your salvation that you proclaim is for real, and whether the confidence you have in God, the conviction you have in the word of God, whether it is real or not. Satan says, I don't know about your testimony, I don't know about your proclamation, but I'm going to try you to know whether it is real. And I pray that when your faith is tried, and when your conviction is tried, you'll be for real in Jesus' name. It says, beloved, seek it not strange concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. It says, it's not strange, it happens to every Christian, the test will come. And God permits the test so that you will prove that you are a child of God, that if you say your sins are forgiven and gone, you'll prove it by the life you live. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Ye, it says, Yes. It says, this is true. It said, this is real. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're examining your life. Have you been persecuted? Have you ever been persecuted? Are you just flowing along like a dead fish that is flowing on top of the river? Or are you living the life that makes people to understand you belong to Christ? And if they don't like Christ, they will not like you. If they hate Christ, they will hate you. If they persecute Christ, they will persecute you. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, but evil men and seducers well, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at that verse. Evil men, the devil makes them evil. And it says they'll wax worse and worse. Seducers, they'll wax worse and worse. Can I tell you something? If Satan has the ability to make his followers worse and worse, then Christ our Savior has the power, has the ability to make the believers, the saints of God, better and better, stronger and stronger, greater and greater. Don't allow the devil to do more for his own children than God will do in your life. If the evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, I want to say that the children of God, the members of the body of Christ and the saints of God shall wax stronger and stronger, greater and greater, better and better while they're deceiving themselves while making progress in the truth of the Lord. That's why it says in verse 14, in verse 14 it says, but continue. Now, Satan has continued his project all this long time. He has not stopped. If you are a real child of God, you too, you will continue. Persecutors have continued and without uh, stopping all this period of time. If you are a child of God, as they continue, you too, you'll continue in the Lord, the candidates for hell. And those who are going down the valley of degradation, they continue. They do not stop. If they have not stopped, you climbing the mountain, the pilgrims and the righteous children of God, you ought to continue, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I will continue. 
I said, I will continue. You will continue in Jesus' name. And let's come to number two there. Number two there is the pronounced punishment for guilty creatures. You see, all these uh, people, and uh, let's come back to that uh, first Peter chapter 4 and in verse 15. It's talking about the sinners who have not known grace, who have not known the grace of God and the godliness we have. Look at their lives. It says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer was a busy body in other men's matters. And you know, those are the people, in fact, even the persecutors, how do you see them? Uh, the persecutors are busy bodies in other men's matters. Uh, look at this. You became a Christian. That's your decision. That's your personal uh, decision. But a busy body in your life. You say, what did you become a Christian? Why did you receive grace? Why did you go to that Bible-believing church? Why did you stand for God? It's none of their business. You have your life to live. And they ought to know that, that you have your life to live. But you see, these guilty creatures and these persecutors, they don't mind their business. They're murderers, they're thieves, they're evildoers, and their busy bodies in other men's matters. And if you are a real child of God, you will not be like them. You will not be evil. You will not be a seducer. And you will not concern yourself about the action and the direction of the people of the world. But you see, there's punishment coming for them because of the evil they're doing. Let's look at them one by one. It says, number one, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. Look at uh, First John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 12. First John chapter 3. It says in verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, a murderer, wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brothers righteous because his own works were evil evil men and seducers their works worse and worse and it says he slew his brother because it's of his brother's righteousness and then in verse 13 it says in verse 13 marvel not my brethren if the world hate you in verse 14 it says we know that we have Pass from death unto life, from spiritual death unto spiritual life, eternal life, everlasting life, godly living. Because we love the brethren. Look at this. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And then in verse 15 it says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in in him, don't suffer as a murderer. Don't hurt anyone. Remember, the Christian is harmless. The Christian will not harm anyone, and you will not hate anyone. Number two, it says, we must not suffer as a thief. We must not suffer as a thief. And look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is describing to us the sinners, the guilty creatures who will not inherit eternal life. It says in First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Know ye not that those who have not been converted? Know ye not that those who are not righteous? Know ye not that those who have not been cleansed? Know ye not that those who have not been made righteous and godly by the cleansing blood of the Lamb? Don't you know that those who have not become just and those who are not obedient? Don't you know that those who are not harmless but they are harmful, that they shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, homosexuals. And then it says in verse 10, it says in verse 10, no thieves, that's it, no thieves. It says thieves shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I was somebody who knows about the kingdom of God and he knows the joy of entering the kingdom of God was still something unimportant. 
something you know, redundant, something you know, useless, something you know, that is not even useful, like a scrap of paper, like a pen in the place of work, like money in the place of work. The things that will not be useful after this life, how foolish a person will be that for the kingdom of God, it will miss the kingdom of God for stealing any amount of money, whether in the office or in the church, it says no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners. None of them shall inherit the kingdom of God. It tells us here in the, the passage we're reading, it says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, let none of you suffer as a thief. Let none of you suffer as an evil doer. Let none of you suffer as an evil doer. Why? Because I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 1, beginning from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 1, we're looking at verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. Look at this, a siege of evil doers. A generation of evil doers, the speeches of evil doers, the people that have become evil in their heart and evil in their action. They are evil in their deeds, in the things they do. They are evil in their thoughts. They are evil in their imagination. They are evil in their action. They are evil in their character. They are evil in their relationship. It says, ah, a sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, seed of evil doers, children that are corrupters, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. It's telling us we shouldn't be like that. It says, let none of us, we say we're Christians, we say we're converted, we say we have eternal life. Let none of us suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evil doer, or as a busy body in other men's matters. Let's come to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're looking at verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're looking at verse 12. A busy body. Who is a busy body? He's busy, but it's not busy about the right thing, about his life, about his own progress about his own commitment, about his Christian life, about the things that concern him. He's busy about the things concerning other people. It says, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. When somebody casts forth his faith, his own faith, he casts it off. His own faithfulness, he casts that off. His own fruitfulness, he casts that one off. His own productivity, he casts that off. His own perception and pursuit of righteousness and progress, he casts that off. In short, he throws away his life. He's careless about his life. And he's not concerned about his life. The thing he spends time on will not bring any fruit and any result into his life. He has cast off his false faith. What's going to be the result of that in verse 13? In verse 13, and without, they learn to be idle, no progress. They learn to be idle. There is no goal. They learn to be idle. They're not looking at life. They're not looking at any destination. They're not looking at what I ought to be and what I ought to do. They have cast off the focus of their life and the foundation of their life. And with that, they learn to be idle wandering about aimlessly, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but it, they are tattlers, you know, talk, 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 unprofitable talk, and it says they are tattlers also, look at this, and busy bodies, busy bodies, speaking things with the ought not. It says, don't allow that in your life, and do not suffer as a murderer, do not suffer as a thief. Do not suffer as an evil doer. Do not suffer as a busy body. Let's come to the third section now. The pleasant personality of God's glorifying Christian. 
the pleasant personality of God honoring Christian, the pleasant personality of God pleasing a Christian. You know, a real Christian who has the grace of God in his heart and he has the focus and the goal and the drive and the pursuit of getting to heaven is a pleasant personality to God, a pleasant personality to heaven, a pleasant personality to the children of God, the pleasant personality of a God glorifying Christian. Look at First Peter chapter 4, verse 16. It says in First Peter chapter 4, verse 16, it says, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Glorify God on this behalf. The people that see you, the people that know you, that you are walking, you are minding your own business, and you are improving on your own Christian life, and you are doing that which glorifies God, which honors God, they will even glorify God with you. Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 16. In Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 16. It says, let your light so shine. It takes effort. It takes commitment. It takes consecration to tune your light and to brighten your light and to put oil in your lamp and to make sure that any time, every, that, that, that will take vigilance. If you're going to make sure that your light is shining every time, let your light so shine before men. That's your concern. That's your consecration. And that's your concentration. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven and glorify your Father which which is in heaven. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 11. It says, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, and that they shall believe a lie. And then in verse 13, it says, While the unbelievers are like the way they are, look at the way we Christians are, we children of God, it says, We are bound to give thanks to always to God for you. It says, Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and believe of the truth. Look at that. Because you are saved and your life is purified and your life is sanctified and makes you holy through and through, it says we are bound to give thanks unto God because of you. Your life is God glorifying. Your life is God honoring. Your life is God pleasing. Your life is God exalting. In First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. In First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 11, as she know how we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. And then in verse 12, it says in verse 12 that she would walk worthy of God so that your life will please God. Your life will glorify God. Your life will honor God. Your life will exalt God that ye should walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. We're coming to point number two now. In point number two, we're looking at the purified partakers with the glorified Christ. The purified partakers with the glorified Christ. And we're looking at three things here. Number one, the peaceful partakers of Christ's suffering. The peaceful partakers of Christ's suffering. Look at First Peter there, chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice, rejoice. Heaven is in your heart. Rejoice. Glory is waiting for you. Rejoice. Christ owns you as his own follower, as his own child, because I partake of Christ's suffering. Rejoice. Rejoice because your name is written in the book of life in heaven, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. 
that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Don't, don't uh, leave that verse yet. Look at that verse. Rejoice. Why do I rejoice? Well, if I look at my at the people who are my colleagues, they too they suffer. If you look at your neighbors who are in the world, they too they suffer. If you look at if you're a student, you look at your classmates. Uh, maybe you say you're sick sometimes. Sometimes they are sick too. You say sometimes you have difficulty. They have difficulties too. Sometimes you say you have, you know, the insult and the assault of uh, some people because you're a Christian. They who are not Christian, they have assault too. They are partakers of the sufferings of the world. But it says, in your own case, you're not suffering like they're suffering. Their own suffering has no reward. Their own suffering has nothing coming from heaven. You will not have any well done from God, but in your own case, the things to suffer. As a partaker of Christ's suffering, it says, when his glory shall be revealed, ye also shall have exceeding joy. That's the reason we're rejoicing. It says in Romans chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 17. In Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 17, it says, And if children, children of God, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, no wonder it tells us to rejoice that we come side by side with Christ. He has overcome and inherits everything and he calls us to be by his side and he says if we're children, if we're Christians, if we're beloved, that we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heir with Christ. Look at this. If so be that she suffer with him. Don't suffer without him. We suffer with him. Don't suffer Contrary to him, we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Then it says in verse 18, the glory of what we're looking for. It says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's why we rejoice, and that's why it tells us that even at such a time, the peace of God will reign in our hearts. In Philippians chapter 4, reading from verse 7, Philippians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 7, it says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding, it's available. It's available for you, my brother, for you, my sister. The peace of God which passes all understanding. The peace of God that is deep like a river. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it tells us those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do look at this and the god of peace in verse 7 the peace of god in verse 9 the god of peace shall be with you despite the persecution in spite of the suffering in spite of what you might be going through the god of peace shall be with you if the peace of god that passes understanding is going to abide with you and the God of peace that passes every personality in the world, if that God of peace shall be with you, what do we think of? What do we meditate on? Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us now, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Leave the persecution alone. Leave the persecutors alone. And concentrate on the peace of God that abides in you and the God of peace that abides with you. And now you are thinking, you're not thinking of Satan. You're not thinking of the world. You're not thinking of evil doers. You're not thinking of those seducers. You're not thinking of those uh, pressure people, pressure groups. You're thinking about whatsoever things are true and whatsoever things are honest 
and whatsoever things are just, and whatsoever things are pure, and whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are good report. You're thinking of things that are praise to God. You're thinking of these things. And then he tells us that we're going to be purified partakers of Christ's sanctification. Purified partakers of Christ's sanctification. And we're looking at First Peter chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 14. First Peter chapter 4, we're reading from verse 14. It says, if he be reproached for the name of Christ, if he be reproached for the name of Christ, if they call you names because of the name of Christ, if they belittle you because of the name of Christ, if they cast aspersions on you, slander on you because of the name of Christ, if your family in the village, your family in the city, your family in, in the extended family, if they look down on you and they say you're ashamed to the family because now you carry the banner of Christ, if they reproach you for the name of Christ, if they look at you as a kind of demeaning look because of the name of Christ, Happy are ye, and the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. On their part, they are not righteous, he is evil spoken of. On their part, they are not shining, and they are not stars, and they are not coming up. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, is glorified when you are sanctified through and through your heart, your language, your disposition, your attitude, your character, your comportment, everything about you is sanctified. You become a purified partaker of Christ. Look at Hebrews uh, chapter 12, we're looking at verse 10. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. It says in verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 12 tells us who we are and it says in this Hebrews chapter 12 verse 10 that will become partakers of the nature of God. It says everything we go through here, the chastisement, and the persecution, it says it doesn't give pleasure uh, for, for day, for a few days, talking about the discipline and the training we have from our parents. It said they chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, the almighty God, he allows this persecution to come and he allows this uh, suffering, affliction to come, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness, partakers of his holiness. You are saved, and then you go to God after that salvation, after you have been called to be an obedient child, and he calls you to be holy, and you know you need a deeper holiness, a richer holiness, a brighter holiness. You go back to God, and you pray, and you are sanctified. He makes you a partaker of his holiness. And then he says in verse 14, he says, when that has happened, Upon. It says, follow peace with all men. Now you're able to follow peace with all men. There's no fighting. There's no strife. There's no argument. There's no conflict. Anywhere you are, everywhere you are, you're a peacemaker. And you're a child of peace. And you're a follower of the prince of peace. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Number one, you're saved and you're peaceful. A peaceful partaker of Christ's suffering. Number two, you're sanctified and you're pure. Purified partakers of Christ's sanctification. Number three now, you are baptized in the Holy Ghost and you receive power. It tells us now about the powerful partakers of Christ's spirit. It tells us in First Peter chapter 4 in verse 14. First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and the spirit of God resteth upon you. The spirit of glory, the spirit of God resteth upon you. You remember what Jesus said tarry in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from high? It says, for ye shall receive power. 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, resting upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and then, it says, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. It says when those disciples, when they prayed together, the place they prayed, it was shaken to the very foundation, and great grace upon them was upon them, and with power and boldness they declared the word of God, that spirit of God, that spirit of glory, that spirit of power, rests upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Power. That power can be multiplied in your life and give you strength in your backbone and give you strength in your conviction. It tells us in a second Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter 12, we're reading from verse 9. It says, and it said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. When you get saved, you have grace, and it's sufficient for everything you might be going through, temptation, trial, persecution, that grace is sufficient for you. And then when you get sanctified, greater grace, abundant grace comes upon your life, and then to live the sanctified life, my grace is sufficient for you. Saved, sanctified, and then baptized in the Holy Ghost, Filled with the Holy Ghost, energized by the Holy Ghost, and strengthened by the Holy Ghost. My grace, the grace increases. The grace becomes higher. And even after you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, the grace of God keeps on coming and coming into your life in greater measures. And every time you'll find whatever the challenge and whatever the responsibility, and whatever the persecution, and whatever the trial, here is what the Lord will be telling you every time. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 10. Uh, Paul, the apostle, talking to Timothy, and he's saying that you know my doctrine, and you know my persecution, and you know everything uh, that I've gone through. He says, all that I suffer, all that I endure, because of the saints, therefore I endure all things, he said, for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 10. It's saying, but thou hast fully known my doctrine and manner of life, Faith, long suffering, charity, and patience. Look at verse 11. It says in verse 11, and my persecutions. It's talking to Timothy and it says, You know everything. You know my life. You know my faith. And you know my commitment. And you know my doctrine. And you know my persecutions and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. The persecution, what persecutions I endured. And he endured that for the saints. He endured that for the salvation of the people it was ministry to. It says, but out of them all, look at this, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. And then it says in verse 12, the same grace I have discovered and the same grace I've enjoyed. You can enjoy that too. He was telling Timothy and he's telling every one of us and he says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It tells us then the peaceful partakers and where are those peaceful partakers? It tells us about the purified partakers. Where are the purified partakers? And it tells us about the powerful partakers. And we are the powerful partakers of the spirit of Christ. And so it tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 
2 Timothy chapter 4, we're looking at verse 18. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, looking at verse 18, here is what he describes to us, and here is what we're going to have. He said, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Look at this. And will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom as you are living your life in peace and in purity and in the power of the Spirit, and the persecution will not decrease the peace and the purity and the power and the affliction and the suffering that you go through because you are a Christian, the affliction, the persecution, the suffering will not tamper with the peace you have and the purity you have and the power you have. Then it says, here is my assurance, here is my conviction, here is my confidence both for me and for everyone that will give their lives fully unto the Lord without reservation. It says the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and the Lord shall deliver you from every evil work and will preserve me and will preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. And my brother, my sister, there you say, Amen. Amen. It is done. It will be fulfilled in every one of our lives. In Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three is the promise preservation by our glorious creator. We're coming to First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 17. In First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God. What's that telling us? It says there's going to be judgment for sure. And it says that judgment is going to be for the whole earth. That judgment is going to be for the whole world. That judgment is going to be for both sinners and saints. That judgment is going to be for everyone in every generation, in this generation, and any generation that will be. But it will begin at the house of God. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it falls, begin at us. If it falls, begin at us, pastors, preachers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. If it falls, begin at us, ministers and members in the church. If it falls, begin at us, beloved believers. If it falls, begin at us within the congregation of the children of God. What? Shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If it begins with the saints, how about the sinners? If it begins with the righteous, how about the unrighteous? And he tells us in verse 18, in verse 18, and if the righteous castly be saved, if the righteous castly be saved, saved because of the righteousness of Christ, saved because of abiding in Christ, saved because of the grace for righteousness that comes to them, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And then he says in conclusion in verse 19, in verse 19, wherefore, let them that suffer the righteous, let them who suffer the saints, let them who suffer the beloved, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God. Your suffering persecution, you abide in the will of God. Your suffering affliction, you abide in the will of God. You are suffering some local tribulation there, you abide in the will of God. You do not allow the affliction the suffering, the persecution to get you out of the will of God. Your sanctification is the will of God. Godliness is the will of God. 
and righteousness is the will of God. And you do not allow the persecution, the suffering. You do not allow the persecution and the affliction. You do not allow the misinterpretation and the misunderstanding. You do not allow the pain, the pressure of persecution to remove you from the will of God. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. While you're suffering, you keep on doing well. And you commit yourself, you commit your life, you commit your inheritance, and you commit your destiny and you commit everything you have spiritually and materially, you commit to the hand of the Lord while you are doing well in that persecution. Let them commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. As unto a faithful creator. Three things we're looking at. Number one, persevering continuation in godliness despite persecution, persevering continuation, that even though the challenges are there, even though the difficulties are there, even though the persecution and the persecutors, they are always there, it says you continue, you continue in godliness and you do that despite the persecution. It tells us in the word of God, it tells us in uh, First Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 15. First Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God with all the various things that will come, the time of peace and the time of persecution, the time of comfort, the time of conflict, and the time of arrest, and the time of unrest, that you will know that you need to continue how you behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. In verse 16, it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, and received into glory. We continue, we continue in the holiness of God, in the godliness that God has given us in spite of the persecution. In Second Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verse 3. Second Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verse 3. It says, according as his divine power has given unto us. Have you received? He has given unto us. Are you embracing that? He has given unto us. Are you enjoying that according as his divine power? He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. In verse 4, it tells us in verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature. That's the holy nature. Of the divine nature, that's the righteous nature. Of the divine nature is a peaceful nature that she may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, in verse 6, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience Godliness, godliness. He wants us to abide. He wants us to continue in the godliness we have as we have come to have a relationship with the Lord. And then in verse 7, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. In verse 8, and it says, if these things be in you and abound, if the godliness abides in you, 
and abounds. And if the righteousness and the knowledge and the goodness of God and the grace of God and the diligence of God, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 9, it says, But he that lacketh these things, godliness, righteousness, faithfulness, and he that lacketh all this in the knowledge of being partakers of the nature of God, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He wants us to abide in them and to continue in them. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 11. Second Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 11. Being then, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, all the things of the world shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? All holy conversation and godliness. It tells us in verse 13 what we're looking for. It says, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Verse 14 tells us, wherefore, beloved, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent, that she may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Number two is a permanent condemnation from godliness and perversion. The permanent condemnation that will come to those who are godly and those who are perverted and perverse. It says in First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 17, reading from verse 17, it says that all the, the judgment that will come will begin in the house of God. And if it falls, begin at us. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? The gospel that calls them to repentance, they have not obeyed. The gospel that calls them to conversion, they have not obeyed. The gospel that calls them to new life in Christ, they have not obeyed. The gospel that calls them to continue in the word of God, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. The gospel that calls them to continue in the word of God, in the will of God, they have not obeyed. If the judgment first begins at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? It says in verse 18, in verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, if those who have repented, those who are converted, and those who are living the life as much as they know, according to the light they have, they're living in righteousness. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? It tells us in Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men all ungodliness and unrighteousness of religious men, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of pretending religious people. It says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness, ungodliness and unrighteousness in the place of work ungodliness or righteousness in the sanctuary in the temple of God, ungodliness or righteousness in the family, in the secret, ungodliness or righteousness of men in the public, the people who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They hear the truth, they know the truth, they know the doctrine that teaches the truth of the word of God, but they hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
It tells us that they are filled in verse 29. In verse 29, it says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, bastardy. It says in bastardy, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boosters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents in verse 31. It says, without understanding, although they have the truth, although they hear the truth, yet they hold each in unrighteousness, and they don't have understanding of what the grace of God demands without understanding. Covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. They have pleasure in them that do them. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 8. In Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 8, it says, But unto them that are contentious, unto them that do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be indignation and wrath. Verse 9, in verse 9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. It tells us in Jude chapter 1, verse 14. Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. In verse 15, what's he coming to do? To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. All ungodliness will be judged by God. It says, this is what they have ungodly committed. Then it says, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners, ungodly seducers, ungodly corruptors, ungodly persecutors, ungodly unconverted people are spoken against him. Verse 16, in verse 16 it says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own laws, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. There's going to be condemnation at the time of judgment for all unconverted, all backsliding, all compromising people, all unrighteous people. The judgment will start in the house of God. And if the righteous castly be saved, where will the sinner, the ungodly, and the people that obey not the gospel, where will they appear? But then those who are committed to the Lord. And because of that commitment to the Lord, you might suffer persecution. You might suffer some affliction. And the sufferings of Christ, a part of that might come upon you. And you might be the happy and the fortunate partaker of Christ's suffering because of righteousness. If you continue, if you endure, if you persevere until the very end, look at what is going to happen. Personal commitment to God for preservation. The Lord will protect you. And the Lord will moderate the persecution. He'll moderate the trial, the trial of your faith. He will not allow that to go beyond the grace he has given you, the strength he has given you, and the confidence he has given you. He will moderate everything, you know, and he will make sure that the limit of age 
will not be go beyond the limit of your grace, the abundance of your grace. Number three now, finally, is the personal commitment to God for preservation. Look at chapter 4 of 1 Peter, and we're looking at verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer, let them young and old, let them men and women, let them preachers and those who are in the pew, let them the ministers and the members, let them those who are saved, those who are sanctified, those who are filled with the Holy Ghost, let them the children of God, the Christians, and those who have come into the kingdom at such a time as this, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls. The keeping of their souls. He'll keep you. He'll keep me. He'll keep us. Persecution will not destroy you. The river will not drown you. And the fire of persecution to try your faith will not burn you up. It says we shall commit the keeping of our souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. A faithful creator he is faithful. And it will moderate the trial, the temptation, the persecution that comes to us. It tells us how faithful God is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're looking at verse 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. There is no persecution taking you. But such as is common to man. You know, sometimes when we go through persecution, we're wondering, why is it me? No, it's not you alone. Why am I suffering like this? No, it's not you alone. Why doesn't this happen to other people? It happens to other people. It is common unto man. It says there has no trial. There has no temptation. There has no suffering. There has no persecution taking you. But such as is common to man. But God is faithful is a faithful creator god is faithful is a faithful preserver god is faithful who will not suffer you who will not allow you who will not permit you to be tempted to be tried to be persecuted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Open your eyes to see the way of escape. Listen to the voice of the Lord. You'll see the way of escape and you will see how he will make you to endure to the very end. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're looking at verse 12. Those who have gone before us, here is the way they did it. Those who have endured and those who have persevered and those who have entered the kingdom of God before us, this is how they did it. They gave themselves fully and completely and deposited their souls in the keeping of of the Lord and the Lord kept them to the end. It tells us in Second Timothy chapter one, verse twelve, for the which cause also I suffered these things, persecution, I suffered these things, trial, I suffered these things, suffering, I suffered these things, all these uh, temporary tribulations. It says, for the which cause I also Paul, I also preacher, I also evangelist, I also apostle, I also the minister of the grace of God, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. That's the confidence you ought to have, that you ought to know whom you have believed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I am persuaded that he is able. 
is stronger than Satan, is greater than all the persecutors, and is higher than all the mountains, and is able to do that. He has preserved thousands and millions of believers before you and before me, and if he has done that for the people that lived in the most dangerous time in Christendom, he, pre he preserved them, he'll preserve you. What are you going through? He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He will preserve you and it will keep you unto his heavenly kingdom. Let's come back to that 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18 again. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're looking at verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me. Praise the Lord. He will deliver you. Persecution. He will deliver you. Trial. He'll deliver you suffering. He'll deliver you. Whatever you are going through now is soon coming to an end. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. No exception. Every evil work. And will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. If you believe that, say amen. He will deliver you and he will preserve you. Whatever has happened in the past and whatever water is coming under the bridge and whatever fire may be burning there, your deliverance is near. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. It says, look at this, who delivered us is done it for people who have gone before us, who delivered us from so great great a death and does deliver at this present time now and does deliver in different parts of the world. There are people who are going through persecution and they're going through some affliction. He does deliver like he was in the past. He is today and it will be forever in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He delivered those in the past. He's delivering those who are living in this same generation, going through what you are going through, going through what we might be going through, and then in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Praise the Lord. He will yet deliver you. Praise the Lord. Let me see a smile on your face. He will deliver you. Praise the Lord. Let me see the expression of joy in your life. He will yet deliver us. Let me welcome you to give me your testimony. He will yet deliver you. He will deliver you in Jesus' name. He has never failed on your case. He will not fail in the past. In the present, in the future, he'll keep on delivering. He says, I am God, I change not. And Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Deliverance has come unto you. Let's look at Jude now. Jude, as we give the glory and the praise to God. Jude chapter 1 verse 24. In Jude chapter 1, we're looking at verse 24. It says in verse 24, now unto him today, today. Now unto him in your life, now unto him in this present generation now unto him that is able your God is able him that is able are you sick he will heal you are you afflicted he'll deliver you are you persecuted he'll bring you out gloriously now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to keep you from faltering and to keep you from failing and to keep you from succumbing and to keep you from being downtrodden and to keep you from you know backsliding he will keep you and unto him now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to preserve and to preserve and to preserve are you there and to preserve you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy verse 25 to him who oh, to the only wise god our savior in your life be glory in your family be glory and then your ministry be glory to the only wise God and our Savior. To him be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now, today, and ever till the end, beyond the end of your life. And the people of God said, Amen. We thank the Lord that the Lord has opened our eyes to his word today. And 
we will finish with joy. And you're going to finish your ministry with joy. You're going to finish your journey with joy. Whatever is happening, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Why don't we rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer? Why don't you rise up, my brother? Why don't you rise up, my sister, and give glory to God? Because the Lord is going to preserve you. Yes, it will preserve you. It's the only wise God. It's our Savior. He's our sanctifier. He is a baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Pray to the Lord. Open your mouth and don't pray crying. Why me? And why this? And why? Th don't ask questions. You understand that we are children of God and whatever happens, we're going to come through and we're going to come over to the victorious side and we're going to come over as conquerors because we commit our lives and we commit a situation. We commit a surrounding dinner unto the hand of the living God who is able and he will preserve us until his heavenly kingdom. Give yourself unto the Lord. There is abundant grace. There is abundant grace and that abundant grace will come from God to the persecuted Christians. Are you not a Christian? Uh, check up. Are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, then you can rejoice. If you're a Christian, you are converted. If you're a Christian, it means that you are also cleansed from the, from the pollution of your life. If you're a Christian, you are righteous. If you're a Christian, you are godly. If you're a Christian, you are just and you are justified. If you're a Christian, you're obedient. If you're a Christian, you are harmless, you're peaceful, you won't hurt anybody. And no matter what you receive and no matter what people throw at you, you remain harmless, righteous, converted, cleansed, godly child of God. And then the Lord has predicted there's going to be persecution. And in that persecution, thank God that the persecution is so moderated, is so limited to the grace God has given you. He predicted it, but then in the present situation, he says it'll preserve your life. He says this sin will not drown you. He says even though he has proclaimed that there will be persecution, the persecutors too, they're going to have their own punishment, and their punishment is going to be more severe than whatever punishment or persecution they can heap upon you. And then you remain pleasant in the grace of God, a pleasant personality and a pleasant Christian, a pleasant child of God, even in the midst of that persecution, so that every time uh, you're bringing glory to God, every time uh, you're bringing honor to God, every time your life is a God-honoring, God-pleasing, and God-glorifying God, and your light is so shining before, before men uh, that everyone that sees your good works, they'll glorify, glorify your Father who is in uh, heaven. Remember, peace comes at salvation. Peace with God. Peace in your heart. Peace in your family. Peace with your wife. Peace with your husband. Don't suspect anybody. Peace with everyone around you. No suspicion. I suspect a so-and-so that is doing that against me. I suspect it's such and such that is tracing up all these uh, slander against me. Don't suspect anybody. Be at peace with everyone. And be at peace in your community. At peace in your place of work. At peace in the church of the living God. Because we, ha we are peaceful partakers of Christ's suffering. And then remain pure. We're purified partakers of Christ's sanctification. Remain pure and remain purified and remain holy because it wants that sanctification to be real, that sanctification to be verifiable in your heart, in your life, in your comportment, in your attitude. And let the power of God rest on you that when you're persecuted and you rejoice and the spirit of glory and the spirit of God will rest upon you on their part is blasphemed, but on your part, God is glorified. And then you rejoice in the fact that the Lord will preserve you. He's giving us that promise, the promise of preservation by our glorious 
creator. He has created us and he has given us assurance. He'll be faithful. He remains faithful. He cannot fail. And because he cannot fail, he will keep you to the very end. Tell the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, praise the Lord. Forget uh, those uh, persecutions now, forget those afflictions, forget the origin, forget who may be responsible for that. Just neglect them, overlook them. If you talk about them, if you think about them, they become big in your heart, in your mind. But when you minimize them and you magnify the Lord in your life and you understand he has promised he's a faithful God and he's going to keep you, he'll keep you faithful to the end. He'll keep you standing you know, unto the end. And he will keep you compromising unto the end. He'll keep you in that faith that he's looking for. When the Son of Man shall come, will he find faith on the earth? He'll find faith in your heart. Give glory to God, unto him, unto the only wise God, our Savior. Be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now today now this week now this year now this life and ever in your life he'll preserve you until the very end give the glory to him let's pray together father we thank you because of your power we thank you because of your promise we thank you because of your faithfulness you called us and we responded and we're now in your kingdom we're saved we're sanctified we're baptized in the holy ghost we thank you because you are forgiving us. We thank you because you have set us free. We thank you because we're converted. We thank you because we're cleansed. We thank you because you have justified us. We thank you because you have brought us into the kingdom. And we thank you because you are so gracious. We have your grace, not just limited grace, not just a little grace, a grace that is sufficient. And you give us peace and you give us peace and you give us power thank you lord because we're in the kingdom and the grace to be obedient and the grace to be faithful and the grace to remain just and justified you have given unto us and lord the life of righteousness the life of harmlessness and the lord life of not hurting anyone you have given unto us that we live our lives now in peace and in purity and in power, you will give all the glory to you for what you have done. Receive our praise and receive the glory in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that uh, there are times we'll go through persecution, our light affliction, the little, little things that come, but we thank you because you are faithful and you moderate and you limit all those uh, temptations and trials and persecution and affliction and suffering. You limit them and you give us abundant grace, sufficient grace to be able to overcome every time and you make a way of escape that we're able to bear everything. We give the glory to you, strengthen all your children even today in Jesus' name. Those who do not have the assurance of salvation, grant them assurance of salvation, assurance of forgiveness, assurance they are in the kingdom and their names are reaching in the book of life. And Lord, we pray that you help every one of us to so commit our souls, to so commit our lives, and to so commit our total personality unto you for safekeeping as we keep on doing well. And we pray that your will will continue in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And we rejoice because we know and we're sure you will keep our souls and that which we have committed into your hand against that day. And when the trumpet shall sound, we will not be found missing. My brother there, my sister there, my boy, my girl, my daughter there will not be found missing in Jesus' name. And we pray that when the saints go marching in, all of us by grace, all of us in obedience to the gospel, all of us who are members of the living body of Christ, we will be there in Jesus' name. And we pray that the reward of faithfulness in this life you grant unto us the reward of faithfulness 
even to the very end, at the very end of our lives, you give unto us and beyond death and beyond the end of life and at the time of the rapture, beyond rapture, you grant unto us that forever and ever we'll be present with you in heaven in Jesus' name. We've started with you. We pray that nothing will turn us back. Nothing will make us look back. Nothing will make us slow down. Nothing will make us backslide. We'll continue until the very end by your grace. And then we'll enter into glory with the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Thank you very much for being available today, being present at the service. And I pray that during the week and throughout your life, the grace to abide faithful and to remain committed to the Lord and the blessings of God and the reward of righteousness and faithfulness, the Lord will keep on giving unto you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a happy Sunday.